Okay, folks, good morning. Um, so, what we are doing this week is starting by taking a slight detour away from Linux Basics just to take a look at version control with Git. Um, the idea being that we want to give you everything you need to understand uh, the assignment submission for, for Friday. So a reminder that uh, assignment one is due Friday night at 11.55 p.m. If you haven't started it yet, I recommend you should probably do that. It's not hard. It, it shouldn't take you too long. But if this stuff is really new to you or if you found that you had trouble in the labs, uh, you'll want to get started. So before I go on, is there, do you have any questions about anything, assignment one or otherwise? I should mention that I have not posted my office hours yet, or, or at least the Zoom link to them. Um, office hours do start this week, so I will be having office hours today at 2.30. Um, I did not post a sign-up sheet for this week, so it will be an open office hour. Anybody can join. Um, if I am in a breakout room when you join, it's just because I'm helping someone with their code or with something that is private. Um, so just wait, and I will be back. Okay. Okay, so let's get into it. Um, we're going to first talk about uh, the benefits of version control, why we use version control, um, and then we'll talk about Git specifically and, and why it is so popular. Uh, we'll then get into some uh, background concepts that you need to understand about Git, and finally we will get into actually using some Git commands. So we'll see basic Git usage, We'll look at how to push to a remote repository and pull from them. And then we'll look at some best practices when using Git, and finally, how we're using Git in this course. OK, so want to take a minute to just sort of imagine, let's say we don't know anything about version control. All right? Um, and let's say that you're working in a large company. You've got potentially hundreds, maybe even thousands of developers. And you're working on this big project with millions of lines of code, tens and tens of thousands of files. Everybody's working on this project you know, day in and day out for months and years. Um, and let's say that we don't have any sort of structured system to handle this. So one way, as I alluded in, in uh, last week's lectures, would be OK. You know, we can just email around our code. So if I make a change to my code, I'll just email it to some guy and maybe he puts it all together and compiles it. Obviously, that's ridiculous. If we're dealing with anything, you know, more than a tiny little project, that's not going to work. So another option would be, okay, well, let's maybe uh, create a network share. So we'll create a directory on, on the network somewhere and everybody will work out of that. So all of our code, we will put it into that network share and everybody just works on it from there. So think about that for a second and tell me what are some of the problems with that approach? So if I put all of my code into some folder on the network and I have all of my developers working out of that, what could happen? What could go wrong? Somebody help me out here. Yes. So what kinds of conflicts? Sure. So Jane down the hall is editing the same file as I am, and she saves her, her changes. And unbeknownst to me, she's working on that file, so I'm happily working away on it too. And then I go and save my changes, and of course I overwrite all of her code. Or maybe I wrote some class yesterday, and all of a sudden I come in today, and where did all of that code go? Somebody overwrote all of my code. Right? Um, maybe we finish a feature and next week it's broken. Somebody somehow broke it. We don't know what they changed. We don't know who did it. We don't know when it happened. Right? These are the sorts of issues that might arise in that kind of a situation. And that's sort of why we look to a version control system to, to solve these kinds of problems for us. So version control system, again, is a software tool that simply manages changes to your source code. It's generally used for software projects, but you can also, I've seen uh, authors writing books using it. Um, you can use it to you know, manage the development of a large user manual, for example. You could use it for websites. Really, any kind of electronic data that you need to track changes to uh, can be put into version control. But of course, most commonly, it's going to be source code. So some of the features of 
a version control system. Obviously, as I've already alluded to, um, they are intended to facilitate collaboration. You might have two developers, you might have 200 developers. You need some sort of structured way that you can manage the changes in your code and ensure that you know I'm not overwriting your changes, you're not overwriting mine. Uh, change tracking, so it, again, every time I commit something into the code, it is keeping track of that change so that we can look at the history later and see who changed what and when. And of course, that leads into then accountability and auditing and context where um, it's not just recording what changed and when it changed, but it's recording who changed it, which can be important sometimes, not to get anyone in trouble, but you know, maybe Jane was working on uh, some code that I was working on and she changed a few lines. And I need to then understand when I go back to that code and I continue to work on it, I need to sort of understand the context there. Okay, what changes did she make and why? Um, of course, backing up and restoring your code. So obviously our laptops could fail at any time. You want to make sure you have some sort of backup, so you push to a version control system. We're not going to talk too much about branching in this course, just because we're looking at basic Git. Um, but essentially what you can do is have parallel paths, parallel streams of development within your repository. So let's say, you know, we're working on version one, um, and I maybe think, oh, what, what if we added this feature? And I don't want to mess with the original code base. I can branch off of that version one development stream and sort of start working on that feature myself. And maybe it's really successful, that experiment works, and then we merge it back into the main code. So it allows this sort of um, parallel development. Reproducibility and reverting. So uh, we're going to see later in this topic that we can essentially travel through time. So maybe we're working on version two of our software right now, um, but maybe 50% of our customers are still using version one. And one of them calls our help desk and they say, hey, you know, when I run uh, version one of your program and I click this and I type that, uh, it crashes. And so we want to be able to travel back in time in our source code to when it was version one. I want to be able to look at the source code, maybe compile it and run it, try to reproduce that customer's problem. Uh, a version control system allows this sort of thing. It also allows us to revert changes. It allows us to undo changes that were made. So maybe someone uh, commits a change to the source code that ends up being really buggy and it causes a lot of problems, it makes it really simple for us to revert that change. And then finally, tagging and releasing. Um, as you're going to see in the assignment one submission, uh, you have to tag a specific commit as your submission. So a tag allows you to uh, mark a particular point in history as being important. So version one, version two, assignment one, and so on. So older version control systems used a centralized model. So in this sort of scenario, you had a central repository. So that was a, a server that everyone connected to. All of the source code was located in the repository. All of the developers then would check out what we call a working copy of the code. So they would have a copy of the code, the current state of the code only, on their computer. And they would work on that code and then they would commit their changes back into the repository. So this was simple, it's easy to learn, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, it's pretty fast to check out code because as a developer, when I check out code from that repository, um, I'm only checking out the current state of the code. I'm not checking out the whole history of all the changes ever made to that code. It's just kind of the current snapshot of our, our current version. Disadvantage here is that we have a single point of failure. So uh, most of the operations in a centralized version control system rely on that central server being up. So if that central server fails, right, if, if the server crashes, then uh, we're not able to work effectively with it. Yes, we still have a local working copy, but we're not, allowed, we're not able to do a lot of operations when that server is down. So we call that a single point of failure. Um, Again, because you have to be contacting the server for most operations, that makes it difficult for you to work offline. If I'm on an airplane, I have no internet access, 
um, I suddenly can't work on my code or not as effectively. And of course, because everything has to contact the server over the network, these sorts of systems tended to be slow. So distributed version control systems came along then, which use a decentralized model. So it's a similar sort of thing here where you generally will still have some sort of central repository. Um, but now, every developer has a full clone, a full copy of our repository, which includes the current state of the code, and it includes the history of all the changes that have ever been made to the code. Okay? Um, so for most of the day, I will be working in my local copy of that repository. I'll just be doing operations locally on my computer, committing changes and so on. And then every so often I will synchronize those changes by pushing them from my local repository, from my copy of the repo, up to a remote repository. Okay? Now, it looks like it's hierarchical here as though you know, the, the central, the remote repository is somehow authoritative. Really, we're all peers. Um, when you clone a repository from, say, Bitbucket, so from repo.csd, um, you're just making another clone of that repo. There's nothing really special about a repository on GitHub or on repo.csd. It's just another copy of, of the repository. So we say that all of the copies are considered to be peers. And then in practice, as I say here, um, typically, you will use a service like GitHub or Bitbucket or GitLab um, just simply as a synchronization point. So if I've got 100 different developers, we've all got our own local copies of the repository, we can then synchronize our changes to this remote repository. So the advantage here is that we've got no single point of failure. If that remote repository goes down, it's just another copy of the repo. All of the developers have one. We can either set up a new remote repository, or we can even configure it to um, uh, synchronize between ourselves. It's easy to work offline. Again, I've got an entire copy of the repository on my system, so if the server goes down, not a big deal. And for that reason, operations are, already, are also quite fast. Disadvantage here is that these systems tend to be a little more complicated, as you're probably going to see. Um, it's not that hard. The basics are, are fairly straightforward, but um, when you're new to Git and, and to these sorts of systems, they tend to have a bit of a learning curve. And of course, because we're not just checking out, we're not cloning um, just the current state of the code, we're cloning the entire history of all the changes ever made, initially cloning that repository is going to be slower. So, Git is a distributed version control system. It was released in 2005, created by Linus Torvalds, who is the creator of the Linux kernel. He created it because at the time he was frustrated with the existing version control systems. Um, I think at the time the Linux kernel was around four and a half million to five million lines of code. Today it's something like 30 million lines, but at the time it was still fairly sizable, four and a half million to five million. You had thousands and thousands of, of people constantly contributing updates to that code, and they needed an efficient way to manage all of these changes that were being made in a structured way. So in response, he developed and released Git. Now, since that time, Git has become just hugely popular. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the question and answer website Stack Overflow, but they run a developer survey every year. So in 2022, they surveyed something like 90,000 developers. And one of the questions on that survey was, what is your primary version control system? Over 93% of them answered Git. So you know, don't take it from me, take it from that, that Git is just, it's a must-know tool. Everyone uses it out there for version control. So we're exercising a little bit of tough love in this course by making you learn this because it's just a must-know software tool. You might also be familiar with uh, GitHub, which is just a wildly popular Git hosting service where you can go and you can sign up, you can create repositories, either public ones if you want to share your code, or private ones if you just want to keep it private to you and you can push your code and, and pull it down onto other systems through GitHub. 
Um, and that was purchased by Microsoft in 2018 for around seven and a half billion dollars. So it just sort of shows you how popular Git is and, and how popular that service is. Uh, Git is very fast and it's highly, highly scalable. So again, it was built to house the development of the Linux kernel, where there's constant updates from thousands of people, millions of lines of code. We need it to be very, very scalable, and Git certainly is that. Um, again, we're not going to talk too much about uh, branching, but it does have strong support for branching workflows. So we can have these parallel streams of development where you know, I branch off from one commit and I start working on a feature, and then maybe I, I later merge it back into the main branch. And as I say, it does have a learning curve, but the basics are relatively straightforward, and we're going to be looking at those in this topic. So before we actually look at how to use Git, we need to understand some of the background concepts. So first of all, we have this notion of a working directory. So the working directory, or also known as the working tree, is simply the directory tree that contains your code base. So when you clone that repository onto your computer, you've got a copy now, and you see all of your files in what we call the working directory. Now, I'm talking about a directory, but it's actually a directory tree, okay? So it, it can have you know, an infinite number of, of nested uh, files and subdirectories. When it's not ambiguous, I will either call the working directory just simply your repository, or I might call it the root of your repository if I'm talking about that top level directory. Uh, the top level of your working directory contains a special subdirectory. Again, if you run ls-la, remember we said that dash a shows you hidden files and directories. So if you run that in your repository, you will see a special subdirectory dot git. Okay, and that's how you know you are in a git repository, or one of the ways. Uh, the staging area. So I'm working on code in my working directory. I now want to stage those changes. I want to sort of group together all of the changes I'm making, either creating files, editing files, deleting files, renaming them. I want to stage all of those edits and, and sort of group them together and get them ready to be committed. Okay? That is stored in a special file within the .git subdirectory called index. And so I can stage as many changes as I like before I then decide, OK, now I want to commit all of these changes to the permanent history of my repository. I can also decide, OK, wait a minute, I actually don't want that change, that edit to that file, to be part of the next commit, in which case I can unstage a change. And it, then it won't be um, included as part of the next commit. So uh, just a few more thing, bits of terminology. Local repository, as the name suggests, refers to your local copy of the repository. So it's located in the .git subdirectory. So we said the working directory, if you type ls-la, you're going to see a .git subdirectory. So let's just quickly make one here. So go in here. I'm just going to initialize an empty repository. And you can see I have this .git subdirectory there. Okay, can everybody see that? I guess I should have turned these lights off here. Okay, there we go. So that .git subdirectory, if we go into it, you don't want to mess with this, but that contains a bunch of uh, files and subdirectories which comprise your local repository. The remote repository then is just a copy of this repository that's located somewhere else. Again, normally we're going to use a service like GitHub or Bitbucket or GitLab, but it's just any remote repository, any, any um, copy that's not located on your system. Yep. So it's used to sort of, I don't necessarily want to have a, a separate commit for every single change that I make. Um, we want to sort of group together different commits, or sorry, different changes, I should say, into um, sort of a logical grouping. So maybe these are all of the changes that add uh, Visa payment to our website. And so we group, we stage all of those changes, we then commit them, 
And as we're going to see, you then have to write a commit log message that describes that commit. So I would say something like adds visa payments to, my, to the site. Um, and then later, I want to, I, I work on the code uh, to add MasterCard payments to my website. And I would then stage all of those changes together and commit those as a batch so that we just sort of have these logical groupings that make sense. Does that, does that make sense? Rather than committing every single individual change to a file and having this unwieldy commit history, you have sort of a more logical history. Does that make sense? No. So if you make multiple edits, so if you stage the first change, that first edit is now on the stage. If I now make another change, that change is not yet staged. I have to also stage that change as well. OK, we'll take a look at that when, when we look at staging. Um, yeah, so the remote repository is just another remote copy of your repository. And we, of course, push our changes from our local repo to the remote repo. And then other developers will pull those changes down into their copies of the repository. So um, we don't need to necessarily understand everything that's going on here, but this just sort of illustrates. All right, so in CS2211, uh, we cloned our repositories to our home directory under a subdirectory courses slash CS2211. So that would be your working directory, OK? Within there, you've got a .git subdirectory. So we say that's your local repository. And within that .git subdirectory, you've got this file index. It's not really important that you understand this, but that is the staging area. So when you do uh, in the assignment submission instructions, and we'll take a look at this in this topic, but um, one of the instructions was, OK, um, make all of your changes. When you're ready to push, you're first going to type git add. When you do an add, it's taking whatever changes you've made, and it's moving them into the staging area. It's getting them ready to be committed, but they're not yet part of your repository. Um, you, if you've looked at the submission instructions, you would have also seen an instruction to commit, to do a git commit. So when you do that, what it's saying is, OK, all of the changes that we have put into the staging area, we are now going to commit them to the permanent history of our repository. OK, so now it moves into your repository, into your local repository. And then later, I would do a git push, as we're going to see, which copies those commits that you have made up to a remote repository. And in our case, of course, that is repo.csd. It's, it's Bitbucket. OK, so just a few more concepts before we dig into it. Um, so what is a commit? A commit is a snapshot of your entire working tree at a specific point in time. OK, so it's going to contain some sort of unique identifier. I think it's something like a 40 character long hexadecimal number. Um, it's going to contain the timestamp, the date and time at which it was created. And it will have a reference to this directory tree, some sort of directory tree that contains um, a tree of all of the changes that have been made as part of that commit. So maybe you have a bunch of new files. Uh, maybe you have a bunch of deletions or some renames, some edits. All of that will be stored within that tree. You will also have the author name, so who made the changes. In some projects, the, uh, who wrote the code will be different from who commits the code. So it also stores the committer name. Of course, for us, you're writing the code and you're committing it, so your name would be in both locations. And then you have some sort of commit message, which describes what does this commit do? What's the point of it? Now, people who are new to Git and don't really care, they just want to submit their assignment, they'll just sort of mash on their keyboard you know, and just type garbage random characters. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Commit log messages are important. Don't do that. Write an actual meaningful commit or commit message. So that's a commit. Now, the commit graph is simply the entire history of all of your commits. Okay, it's represented as a directed acyclic graph. So every time I commit a change to my repository, uh, it adds a new commit to that graph. 
and that commit is always going to maintain a reference to its parent, okay? And there is a special reference that Git will automatically maintain for you called head, that always, Git is always going to point that at the latest commit. The most recent commit is also known as head. So, uh, in the assignment one submission, or, or assignment submission instructions, I should say, um, you're instructed to do some initial configuration using the git config subcommand. You do not need to do this every single time you use git. You would only do this the first time that you are using git on any given system. So the first time I'm using git on compute.gall, I'm going to run through a bunch of commands to configure it. And then it's configured from then on. I don't have to do it again. If I then go home on my laptop and I want to use git, I would run these again. But you don't have to do it every single time you're using git. So at a minimum, you would want to configure your name and your email address. Uh, if you don't do that, Git is going to complain when you go to commit. It's going to say, hey, I don't know who you are. So again, we said it wants to record the author name and the committer name. In order to do that, it needs to know your name and email address. OK, uh, you're also going to want to configure an editor, most likely. As we're going to see in this topic, when you do certain operations, Git may bring up your editor and ask you to write a message, a commit message. And if you don't specify an editor, it's going to use Vim by default. How many people have used Vim sitting in this room? So not many. And what beginners to Vim often find is that Vim pops up and they have no idea what to do. They have no idea how to get out of it. So I would recommend don't put yourself in that situation. Configure your editor. So you see that command, the third line there, uh, core.editor nano. That tells Vim when you need to launch an editor, launch the nano editor, which is a very simple editor, and, and we'll see how that's used uh, in this topic. And then there's just a few other settings that I recommend you specify the default branch main, pull.rebase true. Details aren't really important for our purposes right now. Um, I would just suggest that you paste those in. Now, just uh, one final thought here. If you pass the dash dash global when you're doing the config, it applies to your global git configuration. It will write that to a configuration file called tilde slash dot git config. So the dot git config file in your home directory. If you don't pass global, it will only write it to the dot git slash config file in the current repository. So the changes you, you make will only apply to the current repository. All right, so you've seen this already in lab one. Hopefully, you've successfully cloned your repository. Again, all you're doing there is making a copy of a remote repository when you do a git clone. All right, so let's clone my repository here. OK, so I'm going to do a git clone, repo.csd, uw.ca. If you were using GitHub, they would have instructions on, OK, this is the URL that you should use. But for our course, we're using repo.csd. And this would be the URL. And I'm entering my username dot git. It asks me for my Western username and my Western password. I type that in. It's now cloned it. And it clones it into a directory that is the same name as my repository. So in this case, jshans4. So if you don't specify a path after that URL, it automatically just puts it in a directory with the same name as the repo. If I wanted to, I could say, well, I want you to clone it into a directory called CS2211 instead, and it'll do that for you. Now, one thing to note, and this is going to apply for all of your labs. I went to some of the labs last week because some of the TAs were having some trouble. Um, just you know, certain students were having problems, and the TAs weren't sure what to do. So I stopped by, and I was helping some students. 95% of the time, when you run into a problem in the labs, it's because you haven't read the instructions and followed them. OK, I'm not trying to berate you. I'm just saying I write these instructions step by step. I then test all of them. So I know that they work. If it's not working for you, it's because you've done something wrong. You need to read. And the reason I mention this is because in the lab, one of the first instructions was, all right, 
Type in Git clone and you paste in that URL. And right below it in bold letters, it said important. Make sure you replace user with your Western username. And of course, I still had a bunch of people pasting in user.git. So it's trying to clone a repository that doesn't exist because you are not user.git. You're jshons 4git or whoever you are.git. OK? So when you're in the lab and something's not working, just go back. Take a look at the step. Did I do it properly? Did I fully read all of the instructions there? OK? So one thing that people who are new to Git often run into is that they don't realize they're already in a repository, and then they clone again. They clone a repo into a repo. Don't do that. You need to check if you're already in a repository. Um, it's not super important why that screws things up at this point. Uh, just know that it will cause problems for you. So you have to make sure, am I already in a repository? If so, you don't want to clone into that directory. Go somewhere else. Um, so just check. Now, one of the ways we can check, what did we already say? How could we check? How would I know if I'm in a, a Git repository already? Yep. So you'll have the, right. So the hidden directory. So if I go into my repo, I type ls-la, I see the .git subdirectory there. So that's certainly one way to do it for sure. However, it's not a very good way. It's not foolproof because if I'm in a subdirectory, and if I look at ls-la here, I don't see a .git subdirectory there, right? Um, I'm still in a Git repository because we said a Git repo can contain, you know, as many nested files and subdirectories as you like. I'm still in a repo, but I don't see the .git because it's only located at the root of the repository, at the top level. So that is certainly one way, but it's not the way I would recommend. Yep. Git status. Yes. So yeah, exactly. Git status uh, would be how you would do it. Okay. So I would type. Git status. And we don't really care at this point what it's telling us. We just know, oh, I don't see an error message there. It says, nothing to commit, working tree clean. So what that means, git, git status is telling me, since you last pulled or cloned, uh, nothing has changed in your working directory, in your working tree. There's nothing to commit, OK? What that is also telling me is, OK, I'm in a Git repository. If I was not in a Git repository, and I type git status, I would see fatal, not a git repository. OK, so that is, that is the way you should check. Before you do a clone, just type git status. Make sure it says fatal, not a git repository. Make sure you're not already in a repo, OK? Now, before we continue, um, we should understand the different states that a file can be in. So when I create a new file in Git, it is considered to be untracked. OK, what that means is that the file exists somewhere in my working tree. I've created the file. Uh, but it's not yet part of the repository. We haven't staged it and committed it yet. So all new files will start off as untracked. When I then do a Git add, as we're going to see, it takes that file. It says, OK, it's a new file. We're going to move it into the staging area. We now say that that file is staged. OK, so a file um, will be moved to the staged status, either, again, by typing git add. Or if I have an existing file in my repository that is in the unmodified state, uh, I could type git rm to delete it, git mv to move it. We're going to see this in a little bit. Um, that will also move those changes into the staged state. And then finally, if I have an unmodified file that is in my repository, if I edit that file and I type git add, that also stages it. And we'll see that later on. Uh, unmodified is OK. We now commit our changes to the repository. So that moves the files from the staging area into the repo. And they are now considered to be clean and unmodified. So when I typed git status, I have no modifications here. My working tree is clean. All of my files are currently unmodified. All right? If I make a change to one of my files, so I say hello to, oops, to hello, 
one of my tracked files, so one of my files in my repo that is in the unmodified state, is now in the modified state. Okay, so it moves from unmodified to modified. If I now say type, all right, git add hello, I want to stage that change. Whoops. Now it's listed as uh, changes to be committed. So now it's in the staged state. Okay, so it moves from modified. I type git add. We stage those changes. And then when I commit those changes, I don't know, change hello. Type git status. They've been, that my change has now been committed to the repository and the file is now considered unmodified again. It has not been changed since the last commit, since the commit I just made. Okay, so we have untracked, staged, unmodified, and modified. Yep. Of the which, sorry? So, we'll see this when we look at git commit, but um, you have to specify a commit message with every commit. You can either specify it on the command line, like I did with dash m. If you don't, git will bring up an editor and you'll have to specify it. Yep. Yeah, so it's either git commit, you know, like that, or it brings up an editor. How are we doing for time? Okay. So, as I say, git add is used to stage changes. So let's take a look at a few examples here. So I've got a bunch of files here, file two, three, four, five, six. Um, let's say I want to create a new file in my repository. So we'll create that new file. I type git status. Again, it starts off in the untracked state. If I type git add file one, then it moves to the stage state. It's not yet part of our repository. It's just in the staging area. We're grouping together all of the changes that we are going to commit to the repository. Uh, similarly with an edit. So if I change an existing file, so this file two is already part of my repository. It is currently unmodified and I know that because git status doesn't tell me anything about it, so it must be unmodified. Uh, so if I make a change to it and I type git status now, I see that okay, it's now in the modified state. And if I type git add on file two, now I've staged that change. So now I've got one new file staged and I've got one change to a file staged as well. Uh, if I delete an existing file, so we've got file three here. If I delete file three and I type git status, it's saying, oh, I see that you've deleted a file. You haven't staged that deletion. So it's not going to delete it from the repository until I stage that deletion and then commit that, that change. So I can type, again, git add file three. It's a little unintuitive um, because git add seems to imply that we are adding something to the repo. We're adding a change. We're staging the change, OK? So we're staging the deletion in this case. So I type that. And now that has been staged as well. Again, we haven't actually committed these changes yet. I can still unstage these changes and not apply them to my repo, but we have them staged. Uh, finally, I can rename a file. So I could say file four, let's rename it to F4. And if I type git status, what git is telling me here is that, okay, wait a minute. Uh, first of all, I see that you've deleted file four that was already part of the repository. Um, and now I see this new file, F4, which again is a new file to git, so it starts out in the untracked state. So if I stage those changes, I'm going to stage git add file 4 and F4. I want to stage both changes, the delete and the, the new file, in other words, the rename. And now git is going to take a look at F4, at the contents of it, and it's going to say, oh, okay, I see what you did there. You renamed file 4 to the file F4. Okay, so we've staged that rename as well. Now, yep. So, sorry, can you say that again? Let's say file 
Yep, if they have the same contents, Git will realize that, oh, okay, those are the same files. It takes a hash of all of the contents of the files, it compares them when you do the Git add, and then it realizes, oh, you just renamed that. It's the same file, it just has a different name. Yeah. So that is one way you can stage a delete and a rename. You can, you can just delete it from the file system and then call git add on it. And same with a rename. You can just use the mv command and call git add on it. Technically, that's not the, the git way of doing it. You're supposed to use these commands git rm and git mv. Um, all those simply do is they will uh, first perform the operation in your working directory, so they'll delete the file or rename the file, and then they'll stage that change all in one operation. Okay, so if I take file five, for example, again, I could say rm file five, and then I could say, all right, stage that change, but instead of doing that, I can simply say git rm file five. It's no longer there in my working tree, in my working directory, and the delete has now been automatically staged. Okay, same with renaming. Um, I could say git mv file six to f6. If I look in my directory tree, it's been renamed. And if we take a look at git status, we see that the rename has also been staged. Now, we can also recursively stage changes. So let's say I have a directory tree, a, b, c, d, and we're going to echo F1 to A slash F1. We'll just put some content in these files just to, well, just because. A, B, C, F3. Okay, so if I take a look at my directory tree now, you see I have this nested set of directories um, and they've got some files in them. The only directory that doesn't have a file in it is this D subdirectory. So, if I wanted to stage all of these changes, so first of all, if I type git status, it's telling me, oh, I see this new directory A, it's untracked, so I don't know anything about A or any of its contents, it's not part of the repository yet. So I could type in git add A slash uh, F1, A slash B slash F2, and so on, A, B, C, F3. I could do that, or I could just give it the directory name, so git add A. Okay, um, now in your assignment submission instructions, you'll see git add dot. So what is that doing? What would git add dot do? Yep. Yes, so remember, dot is a reference to the current directory. So when I call git add on a directory, it's telling git, I want you to stage all changes in this directory and all of its subdirectories. So it's doing a recursive stage. In the case of git add dot, it says, all right, I want you to take all changes in the current directory and all of my subdirectories. So just make sure that basically every change from this directory and any of the, the subdirectories will be picked up. So I type git add dot, look at my status, and now you can see we've got our new files in there, AF1, ABF2, ABCF3. Now you'll notice we created a D subdirectory, and that's not included in there. Reason for that is that by default, Git will ignore empty subdirectories. So it doesn't include that in there. Okay, so that is staging changes. We can stage as many changes together as you like. And again, as I said before, you would typically, you know, be working on a, a particular software feature. Maybe we're adding visa payments to our website. I'd be working on those changes and I would group all of those together. I would stage all of those changes and now I'm ready. I'm done that feature. I'm ready to commit it to my repository and I do that with git commit. So we type in git commit and I don't know, just uh, demo git for CS 2211. And so all of those changes now have been committed to my repository. Now, I specified here on the command line with the dash M flag, the commit log message, which describes the commit that I have made. If we look at git status now, you can see the working tree is now clean. There have been no modifications to our working tree since we last committed, since that, that commit I just did. Now, 
Commit messages are not optional. So if I don't specify a commit message, it's going to load up your editor. So let's make a change here. I don't know. And we'll stage that. That change is now staged and ready to be committed. And I'm not going to specify. I'm just going to say git commit. And that's going to load up my editor. Now in this case, I've already configured it to be nano. If you hadn't configured it to be nano, it would have loaded up Vim. And you would be very confused. And you would say to yourself, how do I get out of this? You'd, you'd be in a bit of a pickle. So make sure you follow the instructions on that first slide that I showed you, the git config, to configure your editor as nano. Now, I might think that I'm really smart. And you know what? I'm just not going to type anything in. If you do that, you notice it says aborting commit. So it did not commit. If I look at git status, it's still staged. It's not committed. So I have to type something. So again, um, demo uh, git commit for CS2211. And then if I'm in nano, you're going to have some practice with nano in today's lab or in Thursday's lab. You're going to type Control X to exit. So I type Control X. It's going to ask me, do you want to save your changes? I press Y for yes. It just leave the file name as it is. Press Enter. And now the commit is done. Okay. Now, as I said before, commit messages are important. Don't just mash your keyboard and type in nonsense. Just take a second. Like, don't be that lazy. Take a second to write you know, a, a tiny little sentence that describes the purpose of this commit. Reason for that is that it's valuable if you were working on a project with you know, a bunch of other developers. They need to know what changes you've made and why you've made them. And the, the commit log message helps to give them that context. You also, if you haven't worked as a software developer for a long period of time, you might not also appreciate this. But I can tell you that. You know, six months from now, I'm working on so many projects, and then six months from now, I come back to a project and I just I forget, okay, what did I do again and where was I? The commit log can be really great for reorienting you and, and sort of refreshing your memory as to where you were in a given project. So take a minute, don't just mash your keyboard, write something descriptive. So we have seen how to stage our changes. We've seen how to commit our changes. We might want to view the commit log. Again, if I come back to my project six months later, I want to take a look at, OK, where was I? Or if I'm you know, pulling changes that Jane down the hall made yesterday, and I want to see what changes Jane made, I would look at the commit log. And to do that, you just simply type git log. So if I take a look at git log, we can see the two commits that I just made here. So each commit has got this big, long ID. And we said, again, that Git automatically updates uh, this special reference called head to point to the latest commit in the commit graph. You can see my author name, the timestamp when the commit was made, and of course, my commit log message. So the newest ones are at the top. And then if you scroll down, it shows you in descending order by date. Yep. I'm sorry? Yeah, so each of these is a permanent part of our repository's history now. Um, and we're going to see later that, you know, if let's say that latest commit was a buggy one, I screwed up the code, I broke the build, we can easily revert that. Um, we're also going to see next day that, you know, I can travel back in time to an earlier version and build an older version of my code, maybe fix a bug in you know, version one that my customers are still using, that sort of idea. Yes, exactly. So it's called a detached head state. And we're going to talk about that next day. So, Git log allows you to see the history of your commits, but we may want to see, well, what's been done within those commits. Um, and for that, we use git diff. So by default, if you just type git diff, it will show you the difference between the current state of your working tree and your last commit. OK, so if I'm working on assignment one, and I've got this part two dot script, and this was what it looks like in the last commit. If I were to make a change to it, 
We haven't seen this operator yet. This is the append operator. So rather than overwriting it, we saw the redirection operator last week. This would overwrite the file. This will append to it. We'll uh, revisit that a bit later in the course. So if I append a line to that, and I now type git diff, git is going to show me the difference between my last commit and the current state of the working directory. So we see here in green that uh, one line has been added, hooray, I am done. Now, uh, you can also use it to look at the differences between two commits. In order to do that, you have to understand a bit about how you reference a commit. So there's a number of different ways that you can refer to a given commit. Uh, so we saw that head refers to the latest commit on a branch. Um, and then we have these other special relative references. So if head is the latest commit, head tilde one is gonna be the second last commit, head tilde two is the third last commit, and so on. Okay, so you can refer to commits by those relative references. You can, of course, refer to them by their commit IDs. So again, if we take a look at git log, I could refer to them by these IDs here. Now, I do not have to specify the entire 40 character uh, number, commit ID. Just, you know, the first four or five digits, enough to make it unambiguous, and that's fine for Git. Okay, so you can do the relative references, you can do it by commit ID, and then you can also do it by tag. So we're gonna see in a little bit that Git allows us to mark certain commits as being important in some way. Okay, so you might have a tag for version one, a tag for version two. Of course, when you're submitting your assignments, you've got an ASN1 submission tag on, on your submission commit. Okay, so you can also refer to them by tag. So again, if I type git diff, that's the difference between the last commit and the current state of the working directory. If I wanted to, uh, let's see the state between the second last commit and the current state of the working directory. So in order to do that, I could type git diff head tilde one. And that will show me all of the changes made since that second last commit, okay? In, in which case, in the last commit, I added this line, and in the current working directory, I have added this line. If I wanted to say, okay, show me the changes between uh, this first commit and this uh, second last commit. Okay, so I can do git diff head tilde two because we're saying this is head, this is head tilde one, this is head tilde two. So head tilde two to head tilde one. And that shows me that, okay, so in the first commit, you had this line, this is part one of assignment one, and then this, this commit afterwards added this line here. Okay. Now, if you had multiple files with multiple changes, it will show you everything. It'll just show you a big, long list of all the files and all the lines that have changed in all your files. You could also say, well, I only want to see uh, the commits in part1.txt, in which case it would just show you the, the changes for that particular file. Okay, so that's the git diff command. Um, another thing I can do, as I mentioned, we can reference commits by their IDs. So instead of saying git diff head tilde two, head tilde one, to show me the differences between this commit and this commit, I could say, let's take the first, say, four digits there. These are hexadecimal numbers. Take the four digits there, and that gives me the same output as before. Okay, so just another way to reference commits by ID. Okay, so tagging. So we've already seen, hopefully in the labs, you've tried um, submitting your labs, in which case you would have created a tag. Yep. Sure, you, you can view the changes between any any commits. It doesn't matter how many commits are between them. So if I wanted to, so you're saying, could I view it between, say, the first commit and the last commit? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So I can either say git head tilde two and head, or I could do it by commit ID, 
whoops, I'm sorry, I forgot the diff. There we go. And that'll show me all of the changes made between those two commits. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. So git tag, again, allows us to mark certain uh, commits as being important in some way. Um, so let's say we have version 2.0 of our software, and this commit represents, okay, we're finished version 2 now, we're going to tag that, git tag v2.0.0, and if we look at our log, you can now see in addition to head, it has the tag version 2.0 on it as well. So if you don't specify a commit, by default, it's going to add it to the last commit. So I don't know, CS2211. Git log, and you can see now we have yet another tag attached to that as well. If you want to tag a specific commit, you're simply going to either specify it by its relative reference or by its commit ID. So if this was version 1, I could say, all right, Let's tag that, git tag version 1.0, and I just specify the first four digits of the commit ID, git log, and now we've got a version 2 and a version 1. If I want to list all of my tags, I simply type git tag. So git tag will show me all of the tags I've created. And if I wanted to delete a tag, I'm going to use git tag dash d. So you're going to see that in the assignment. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. If you need to resubmit your assignments, you're going to delete your submission tag and basically recreate it. So uh, if we delete the CS2211 tag, it's deleted it. It does not delete, it doesn't delete the commit that the tag is associated with. It just basically untags that commit. So now you can see this one is no longer tagged CS2211. Now, um, yeah, so when you create a tag, so if I, I created this version 2.0 tag, for example, that's only creating it in your local repository. If I do a git push, it will not push that tag to the server. So the way you tell it to do that is you then say git push dash dash tags, and that would then push any tags that you've created locally up to your remote repository. Okay, we'll see that later on. I'm going to give you an example, run through an example of submitting your assignment. So, again, git tag, you know, version 3.0, that's going to create it locally. And then if I do git push dash dash tags, that actually pushes it up to the server. Same goes for deleting tags. If I go and delete a tag with git tag dash d, that only deletes it locally. If I've already pushed that tag up to the server, I also have to push that deletion up to the server, and you do that with sort of this weird um, syntax here. So if I had, so uh, just a minute ago, I had deleted the CS2211 tag. I said git tag dash D CS2211. If I then want to push that up to the server, I would say git push origin. Origin is by default in git the name of your remote repository. So I would say to the origin, I want to push colon refs, tags, and then whatever tag you want to delete. So in this case, CS2211. It's kind of a, a strange syntax, but that's how you tell the server, okay, I want you to delete that tag. Okay, any questions before I move on? We're good? All right. So I mentioned last day that Git allows you to kind of travel through time. You can travel back to certain commits to see your repository in a given state. Okay, so let's take a look. I think I have another repository set up for this. Yes, I do. Okay, so where are we at here? Our team has just finished version one of our software. Okay, and now we're working on version two. So we're gonna change this to version two. This is an excellent program. Okay, that's wonderful. Finish version two. We release it, probably gonna tag it. And now we've got our version two with version two in it. We've got our uh, version one tag where we finished version one. Oh, maybe we'll release one more. It's 
So we stage our changes, we commit them, and again, what the heck, why don't we tag? So now we've got three releases, and that's wonderful, but 50% of our customers are still working with version one. They, they don't want to pay to upgrade our software. Um, so one of our customers calls up the help desk and they say, okay, you know, I'm using this version one of your software and it's got this bug. When I, you know, do this in your software, it crashes. So we want to travel back in time and take a look at that software, maybe build it and run it in its version one state and try and fix that bug for them. So the way we can do that is with the git checkout command. So with git checkout, you are going to provide it a commit ID, uh, the, the commit of the, um, sorry, the ID of the commit you want to travel back to. So let's say I want to travel back to version one. I could either use its commit ID, I could say head tilde two, or I could reference it by tag. So let's do it by tag. We'll say, so just to prove here before I do this, this is version three of our software. Now I'm going to check out the version one tag. And so let's see what it's saying here. Okay, we're switching to the version one commit. It says we are now in a detached head state. You can look around, make experimental changes and commit them. You can discard any commits you make in this state without impacting any of your, your main code base. So in other words, if I make changes here, it's not going to mess up the present day code. If I switch back to the present day code, any changes I make here by default are going to be lost unless I move them onto another branch. And we'll see that in just a sec. Okay, so let's take a look. We can now see, all right, we're back. We've traveled back in time. We're now back in the state of the code as it was in version one. And of course, if we look at our log, we see that we're at version one. And it looks like the head of the repository they, in other words, the latest commit is pointing at that version one. Really, we're, we call this a detached head state. If you look at git branch, we're actually not on the main branch. We're not on the main stream of development. We're in this sort of alternate reality where version one was the last commit. Okay. So as, as I showed you, our working directory now reflects the state of the program as it was in version one. And again, this can be useful if you need to build your code, an old version of your program, you want to uh, investigate a bug for your customers in an old version. You can also do experiments and sort of these what if scenarios. Maybe your team went down a certain path and pursued, you know, some sort of, you made some sort of decision along the way. Um, you can sort of go back and say, well, what if we would have done it this way? and you can do some experiments without messing with your main code base. Uh, so, as I mentioned, we can also make changes. So, I'm editing the version one code. I'll say I am fixing this bug in version one. Okay. If I type git status, so we see I'm in a detached head state. In other words, I'm not in the, the mainstream of reality. I can stage my changes, commit them. So we'll say fix bug in version one. And now, okay, we see that commit. If I were to switch back to my mainstream, as I said, we would lose that commit. That commit would be discarded. So again, if I type git branch, it's telling me that normally I would develop on this main branch, okay, in the, in, the, in the real stream of reality. Right now I'm in this alternate reality. If I switch back, if I were to say git checkout main, then any changes that I've made would be lost. So what I can do here is say git checkout dash b for, main, in other words, create a branch. We'll call it alternate reality. So now, if I look at git branch, I'm in this alternate reality stream. And if I look at my log, again, we can see that this is the, this is the version of reality where after version 1.0, we then went and fixed a bug. And we did not go on to release version 2 and version 3. Okay? But if I check out my main branch, 
you can see, okay, that's the version of reality where we did. After version one, we released version two, we released version three, we didn't go back and fix that bug. Okay, so now we have these two realities, these two parallel streams of development. And so that, that can be very useful. Again, if, if you've got a whole bunch of customers who are still using version one, you can have part of your development team working on that alternate reality branch or that version one branch or whatever you want to call it. So they can be happily working away, making commits to this branch. Maybe we fix another bug. I am fixing yet another bug in version one. Okay, so we stage our changes, we commit, fix another bug in version one. And again, so now we've got this parallel stream of development where we're making all of these changes to our version one code, but at any time, we can switch back to the main branch and we haven't affected our main code base. I think that's cool. So this is sort of what it looks like. Um, in the purple there, that was our main branch, okay? We had, we had done a bunch of commits, version one, version two, version three, and then what I can do is sort of create another commit in the past and move it to another branch. So I'll move it to another branch that we'll call alternate reality, okay? So you switch back to present day by checking out your main branch. And yeah, that's, that's really all I wanna talk about for time travel. There's a lot you can do in Git with branching. You can do some fairly advanced workflows. Don't wanna really get into that too much in this course since we're just starting out. Um, but just wanted to sort of illustrate how you can sort of go back and change the past without affecting your, anything you've done since then, without affecting your main code base. Any questions on that? Yep. No, so you have, so if I am on the main branch, I'm going to see all of the changes made to that file in the commits that belong to that branch. So we see our version three code. In the alternate reality branch, I am going to see only the changes that were made on that branch, so only my version one code. So in that version of reality, we had released version one, and then we added that line that fixed a bug, and we added another line that fixed a bug. So no, we don't see any of the changes that were made on the other branch. Now there is a way to eventually merge a branch back in. So if, you know, maybe you create a branch um, that you wanna develop some feature, and it's maybe an experimental feature, and you don't want, while you're developing it, you don't wanna break the code in the main branch. So you can go off on a branch and you can do your development on that feature. Once you've got it done, you've got it perfected, you can then merge it back into the main branch. So that is, that is a possibility as well and that's, that's done frequently. Yeah, does that answer the question? Okay. Okay, so I mentioned last day that one of the cool things about Git is that it makes it really easy to revert changes. So if you've got some shady developer and, I don't know, they screw up your code, they break the build, um, you can very, very easily undo that with the git revert command. Okay, so let's say, let's just get back to the main branch here. And I don't know, let's just say somebody accidentally deletes all the code in your program. And this sus developer, as my 12-year-old son would say, commits the change. This is my fantastic code. And okay, we, we pull those changes down later and we realize, oh my goodness, this noob developer has gone and screwed up all of our code. They've broken the build. In life, you do not want to be that person who breaks the build, okay? So, we want to revert these changes made by this sus developer. My son's gonna be so proud of me. So what we can do is simply say, all right, we're gonna take that commit and we're gonna revert it. Git revert. It's going to bring up your editor. So again, remember to configure your editor. 
Otherwise, it's going to bring up Vim. If you don't know how to use Vim, you probably won't know what to do. We're going to cover that next week. Uh, but nevertheless, it will bring up your editor. It's going to ask you, you know, do you want to specify some sort of commit message? So I can just say, I don't know, revert that commit by the sussy developer. And we save that, we press enter. And so what it has done, it will not delete their commit, all right? Um, because in Git, we don't actually want to change history. We don't want to change existing commits. Instead, what it's going to do is generate a new commit that simply undid all of their changes. It reverted all of the changes that our sussy developer made. So if we now take a look at the state of our working directory, it's back to how it was before. Okay, so that's the git revert command. Now, a related command, and I don't have this in my slides, uh, but if you have, I don't know, let's say you're working on assignment one, and you accidentally overwrite one of your files. And you're panicking, oh my goodness, I was, you know, I was done assignment one, I was just about to hand in, and now I've overwritten it, what do I do? No problem, it's so easy. As long as that file has already been checked into your repository, you can restore it. So I could simply say git restore program.c, and it tells you this right in git status. So if you don't remember, you look at git status, you just follow the directions. I'll simply say git restore program.c, and now my working directory is clean again. And if I look at program.c, it's back. Okay, so the git restore command. That will get your files back from the last commit. You can restore files from older commits if you want to. So git restore. Um, remote repository. So, so far, everything we've done we have been looking only at our local copy of the repository. So all the commits I'm doing, the revert, you know, um, everything has been only in that local copy of my repository inside that .git subdirectory. Um, generally, you're going to want to then take those commits and push them up to a remote repository so that you can synchronize with other developers. I'll push my changes from my repo and I'll pull down changes that other developers have pushed into my copy of the repo. So when we talk about remote repositories in Git, uh, we refer to them as remotes, okay? That's just the Git lingo, it's a remote. The default name for um, your remote in Git is origin, okay? So when I clone a repository, that remote repository by default, Git saves it under a name called origin. Um, yeah, and there's nothing special, as I talked about last day, there's nothing special about other copies of my repository. There's nothing special about a remote. Um, it's really just another full copy of my repository that happens to be running on a remote server. Okay, um, that being said, most people will use a service like GitHub or Bitbucket or whatever as their remote so that they can collaborate with others. But there's nothing really stopping you from just setting up a server online, putting a Git repository on it and using that as your remote. It's just most people don't wanna to go to the trouble. So if I want to see the remotes in my repository, and you can have more than one, by the way, um, Maybe I push all my code generally to GitHub, but I could also push my code to other developers directly within the project. I generally wouldn't do that, but I could if I wanted to. So if you want to list the remotes in your project, you simply type git remote. That one doesn't have, so let's go into one that does. So I type git remote and it tells me you've got one remote, and again, by default, that is going to be called origin. If I want to show some information about that remote, I'll simply say git remote show and then the name of the, of the remote. So in this case, I'll say show origin. That's gonna ask you to authenticate. I've got authentication set up a, a different way. Um, but after you authenticate, you type in your username and password. It just gives you some information about that particular remote. It tells you what branches are, are on the remote. So we have our main branch and there's a couple of other branches I'm using in this course um, for the assignment submission system. 
and it gives you some information on, okay, uh, when you pull changes, so when you run a git pull, this is the URL it's going to pull from. When you push changes, this is the URL it's going to push to. I don't know why you would want those to be different. I'm sure that there is a valid reason why it's possible to have a different, a different URL from which you pull, um, different from the URL to which you push. I'm sure there's a good reason, but I've never seen or had a need to do that. So anyway, that's how you view information about the remote in your repository. And then if we want to pull changes down, we're going to do a git pull. Okay, so I don't think I have any changes. Okay, so I'm already up to date. So let's make a change. Oh, I don't know. So I'll make a change to my repository. And we'll push it. I'll go into another copy of my repository where I don't have that. And just to prove, okay, and I'll type git pull. So what that's telling me is, all right, I went out to the remote, I pulled down all of the changes, all of the commits that you don't have in your current version of the repository, your copy, and then it will merge any of those changes from those commits it pulled down into your working directory. So it will apply those changes to the files in your working directory. And you can see here it's telling me that, okay, it looks like there was one line added and a bunch of lines deleted from this file, hello. So if I look at hello, all of its contents are gone now because I had overwritten them in my last commit with that one line. So that's git pull. And just a visual of what's going on there. So the top there is the server. And we'll say that there were two commits that I currently do not have in my local copy of the repo. So all git pull is really doing is it's going to download them. It's going to, it's going to run behind the scenes a git fetch. So it fetches those commits into your .git directory, into your local repo. And then it runs a git merge, another operation that will take the changes in those commits and apply them to your working directory. And then finally, as we said, it updates that special head reference to point to the latest commit. And now we are synchronized with the server. OK, pushing changes, you're doing git push. And of course, that is the reverse operation. So we have a bunch of commits locally, and we want to push them up to the server. So you just saw me do that. I made a change. I ran git push, and I pushed up that change to the server. Now, sometimes you're going to run into a scenario. Let's get some Tmux action going on here. And we'll pretend that we've got two developers here. So dev1, all right. So we've got two developers. They're working on the code. Um, I don't know. This person creates a file called dev1. In their copy of the repo, this person creates a file called dev2 in their copy of the repo. Okay, so they've got different working directories, both on their, on their separate laptops. And we'll say that dev1, okay, commits awesome changes from dev1. And we push that up with git push. Now that's up on the repository or on the remote repository. Okay. Meanwhile, Dev2 had been working. They made some changes. Uh, they go to commit them. Awesome changes from Dev2. And they try to push. And Git says, whoa, 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 not so fast. You have some commits, or there are some commits on the server that you have not pulled down to your local copy of the repository. So it's telling you exactly what, it's, it's doing it in a long-winded way, but it's telling you what to do. If you want to integrate the remote changes, use git pull before pushing again. So basically, it just wants you to pull down those changes first, and then you can run your, your push. OK, so what's happening here is that uh, developer one pushed up a commit 
So that's the green one there. It's on the server. And then developer two created another commit. They both had the same parent commit, right? So we now have these, what, what we call a, a diverging branch, where, OK, on the server side, it went one way. We had this commit from developer one. And now on developer two's computer, it's going a different way, where we have this other commit from developer two. And so it doesn't know how to handle that situation. So all it wants you to do is first do a git pull. That's going to download that commit from the server. And then it's going to merge it into your local copy of the repository. And then it's going to run what's called a rebase operation. So it's going to take this red commit here, that developer2 commit, and instead of pointing at its original parent, it's going to rebase it. It's going to rebase it on top of the commit or the commits that it downloaded from the server. So essentially what it's doing is it's saying, all right, I'm going to replay all of the changes made in this commit. Instead of on that second commit there, I'm going to replay them on top of any of the commits that I just downloaded from the server. We call that a rebase operation. Um, you may remember from last day at the start, I told you, OK, just paste this line in. It was like git config dash dash global pull dot rebase true. That's essentially configuring that behavior. So when there are changes that get pulled down, we are going to rebase any new commits that we have on top of those. So now we don't have diverging branches anymore. And so I can then push my commit up to the server. And everybody's happy again. Now we're synchronized again. Does that make sense? OK, so bottom line is, before you do a push, always do a pull. Because in a multi-developer environment, um, people are going to be pushing all the time. And you are certain to have a situation where there are commits on the server that you have not yet pulled down. So you got to pull first and then do a push. So let's do that. We do our git pull. You see here that it says successfully rebased. So again, it took my commit from dev2, which used to be on top of this change hello commit, and it rebased it. It essentially replayed the changes made in this commit to this last commit that I pulled down from the server, from developer one. Now, merge conflicts. You are going to run into merge conflicts in any kind of multi-developer environment. So a merge conflict is going to arise when you and I are both working on a particular file at the same time, and we're editing the same lines. We try to push our changes. We've both got different versions of that file, and so Git doesn't know what to do. Um, another situation is where you're editing a particular file, and I go and delete it in my copy of the repo, and we both try to push those changes. That's, that'll be a merge conflict as well. So let's take an example here. OK, so Joe's on his laptop. Jane's on, whoops. Jane is on her laptop. And they both are working on this repository that has a readme file. So Joe is happily working away. And he, on line one, writes, Joe was here. Meanwhile, all right, not meanwhile, I should say he then commits it. So I don't know, edit readme from Joe. OK, and he pushes that up to the server. So this is what Joe's history looks like now. We have that initial readme file. He made a change to it. He pushes it up to the server. And this is what his version looks like now, where he has edited line one. Now meanwhile, Jane doesn't know that Joe's working on that file. So she happily goes and edits it. And maybe, I don't know, she changes line two. So she says, Jane was here. And so we now have two different copies of the same file. Okay, The one from Joe, Joe was here. The one from Jane, Jane was here. So she commits her change, edit readme from Jane. And she tries to push. And of course, we just saw a minute ago that uh, if there are any commits on the server that we have not yet pulled down, we have to pull them down first. So no problem. 
Jane does a git pull, and uh-oh, what do we have here? A merge conflict. Okay, so it tells her that we've got a merge conflict in the file readme, and it tells you exactly what to do. So again, these are long-winded error messages, but they're, it, they do instruct you with all of the steps you need to get yourself out of this situation. So it wants you to resolve all the conflicts manually, and then it wants you to mark them as resolved with either git add, so stage your changes, or maybe you delete the file with git rm. Um, and then once you're done, you're going to run this git rebase dash dash continue. Okay, so let's just follow directions. So we go, we edit our readme file, and okay, this is a little weird. So what this is telling us is that on the server, Everything between this line here and this line here, that's what the server has as its latest commit. Everything between this line and this line is what Jane has on her system as the latest commit. And so Git is saying, all right, in Joe's version, line one had some text on it, line two was empty. In your version, line one was empty and line two had some text. I don't know what to do with it. You need to sort it out. So okay, fine, we'll do that. So we just edit the file however we think it should be. So if, if this were code, you would kind of have to look through the code and say, OK, yeah, I see what changes Joe made there, and then sort of merge your changes in with, with that developer's code. OK, so Jane decides, all right, I'm going to resolve this by we'll keep Joe's line on line one, we'll keep my line on line two, and that seems reasonable. So we do our git status, all right. It, it reminds us what we have to do. Um, you're currently rebate, so we're currently are fixing a merge conflict. So we want to fix the conflicts and then run git rebase, dash dash continue. So I'm going to run a git add on my readme file, stage the change. I run my git status, it says, okay, all the conflicts have been fixed, run git rebase, dash dash continue. So I'm just following directions. Sounds good. It gives me an opportunity if I want to edit my, my commit log message. So I don't know, I could say edit readme from Jane with merged changes from Joe. We save that up. And now it says we have successfully resolved the conflict. And so we now have our uh, a commit from Jane rebased on top of Joe's commit and properly merged. Now I'll just point out here, you'll notice in your commit log it says origin head is on this commit and head is on this commit. So in other words, the remote's latest commit is this one here, my latest commit is this one here. So in other words, I have a commit that I have not yet pushed up. So I will run git push, that pushes that merge change to the server, and then later, so Joe's got that version, I've got that version, later Joe can run a git pull, and now he's got the up-to-date merge copy as well. Okay, so that's a merge conflict. Um, you kind of have to be careful because normally it's not just going to be a simple case like this where you're just, you know, changing different lines. Somebody, could, you could be working on the same Java class or the same Python class. Someone has gone one way and, and added some functionality to a file and you've gone another way and added a whole bunch of other functionality and you have to kind of carefully uh, sort out that situation and decide how you're going to merge those changes together. Okay, let's take a 10 minute break and we will finish up with Git. So that's as far as we're going to go in terms of the commands we're going to learn in this course for Git. Git is so advanced, you could learn so many more things about it, but uh, we're just going to kind of scratch the surface just to give you kind of a working understanding of, of how to use Git, how to push to a repo, that sort of idea. So just some best practices when you're working with Git. Um, you will read this online often when you're talking about any kind of version control, but you often see this. Uh, when people are talking about Git, and that is to commit early and often. So what we're saying there is, you know, don't wait till the end of the project. Don't wait until you've finished all of version one of your code and then submit this huge long commit with all of these changes. 
you want to commit early and often. You want to do it, you know, every day, multiple times a day. So small, frequent commits make it easier to track the changes within your project. They make it easier to uh, understand your project history, right? If I've got a bunch of changes in my Git log, um, I don't know. Let's just say, you know, my, my changes look like this. Um, finish version three, finish version two, finish version one. So if those are my commits in my Git repository, and I run a Git log and I see that, as a developer, that doesn't tell me anything, okay? What did you do in version one? What did you do in version two? You know, you want to see things like, I don't know, um, finish website theme, add visa payments to site, maybe the next commit is adding MasterCard payments to the site, and so on, right? Something descriptive. Now, you don't want it to be super, super granular where it's like every single file that you change, you know, you have like edit, I don't know, index.html, edit style.css or something like that. You don't want to be super low level, but you kind of want to group together major features. So again, adding MasterCard payments is maybe one commit. Adding Visa payments is another commit. And that way when developers take a look at your log, they sort of have a, a good idea of, okay, these are all the changes that have been made in this commit. They added this feature, they added that feature, and so on. <clears throat> Another reason why you want to commit early and often is we saw before with the git restore command. If you have committed a file to your repository, it's very easy to run a git restore and get that file back. If you happen to overwrite it or delete it, you can run git restore. So, um, as long as you have committed that file, you're fine, you're safe. Okay, we already talked about this last day and I just talked about it a moment ago, but you want to write meaningful commit messages. You don't want to just mash the keyboard. Students often do that. They're playing with Git. They just want to quickly, you know, submit their code. They don't care. So they'll just mash the keyboard and, and type a bunch of gibberish characters. Um, you want to clearly just take a minute, describe what you changed and why you changed it. That will let other developers working on your project know, again, you know, okay, you just added Visa payments to the site or MasterCard or whatever. It also lets you know, six months down the road, you're going to come back to this, your manager's going to say, oh, we need to add this functionality to the site, and you're not going to remember, where was I again, what, what had we done last? So you take a look at the Git log. <clears throat> The style you use doesn't really matter, but it's important that you kind of, you know, choose one style for your commit messages and stick to it. So uh, the style that I adhere to and, and lots of other people adhere to is that I pretend that I am completing the sentence, applying this commit will. So applying this commit will add visa payment to the site or enable multi-factor authentication and so on. The reason is that every time you download a commit, when you do a git pull, it is taking that commit and it's merging it. It is applying it to your repository. So when I apply the, this commit, it's going to add visa payments to my site and so on. So again, it doesn't really matter what style you use, but that's a fairly common style and, and I like to follow that one. Again, we saw we need to pull before we push um, and then handle merge conflicts carefully. So again, Jane might have made a whole bunch of changes to the class that I'm working on. I don't just want to, you know, overwrite all of her changes and blow them away. That might have been days of work or hours of work uh, for her. So I need to sort of thoughtfully think about, okay, well, how are we going to merge both of our sets of changes together? And then finally, and this goes hand in hand with committing early and often, you also want to push regularly. Um, every time you do a git commit, that's great if you're, you know, several times a day you're doing these short, early, frequent commits, um, but they are only in your local copy of the repository. If your laptop dies, there goes your code. If you do a git push, you push to a remote, you can always clone that repository again. So push regularly. Pushing regularly also reduces the frequency and the impact of merge conflicts. If we all wait till the end of the month and then we push all of our changes that we made, potentially hundreds or thousands of lines of changes, then when I go and pull down your changes, 
I am going to have a huge headache merging all of those changes into my version of the code. But if we are pushing regularly to the server, we push multiple times a day, um, yeah, we're still going to run into merge conflicts, but they're going to be smaller ones. OK, my recommended workflow for CS2211, I recommend you just work on your laptop. So in topic one, I showed you how to set up a Linux-like environment on your laptops. So you can do all of your code on your laptops. You don't have to SSH into compute.gal. However, we did say that we are going to be testing your assignments on compute.gal. So you want to leave time at the end of an assignment to uh, get your code on compute.gal and test it and make sure it works. How do you get your code on compute.gal? You push it to your repository, and then you pull it down onto compute.gal. OK, so you're working on your laptop. You make your changes. You do your git add, your git commit. You do a git push up to the server. Then you SSH into compute.gal. You go into your repository directory, and you run a git pull. That pulls down your changes, and now you can build your code and run it. Uh, same for getting help. Don't email us files, and don't you know, attach files to the OWL messages. Push your code to your repo. Send us a message with your question. We'll go and either clone your repo or we'll take a look at it online. And there we go. We can help you with that. So um, yeah, you've practiced this in the labs, but I will just quickly go through a demo of how I would submit an assignment. All right. So I'm ready to submit. I can stage my changes, commit. So I'll say finish assignment one. I could type. I push my changes to the server. So now my code is on the server, but I have not yet submitted. I have to tag that commit to tell us, to tell me and the TAs, that <clears throat> this is the commit that represents my official submission. So even if you push your code, you have not submitted. So I am going to tag it as, for assignment one, it'll be ASN1 submission. And I'm going to run git push dash dash tags. That pushes that to the server, and the server is going to then send me a confirmation email. And there it is. OK, the commit tagged with ASN1 submission in my repository has been recorded as received. That is your official submission date and time, OK? Not what it says in your Git log. It's what the server recorded it as. If you don't get that email, wait about 5, 10 minutes. Check your junk mail folder. You should get that email, but if you don't get it, then follow the instructions to resubmit. So let's pretend I want to resubmit. So what are we doing when we submit? We're committing, we're pushing our commit, and we're tagging that as, OK, this is my ASN1 submission tag. To resubmit, we are going to untag and then simply you know, make whatever changes we need and tag our new commit as, OK, this one is my ASN1 submission. All right, so I'm first going to delete git tag dash D, assignment one submission. And again, we said we had that weird syntax where if I want to delete it from the server, I have to say push to origin, refs, tags, and whatever tag you want to delete from the server. So now it's been deleted from the server. Now I can make whatever changes I need to make. So I don't know. This is my fixed code. <clears throat> I stage those changes. I commit them. Fix assignment one. Push them to the server. And again, I'm going to submit again just with tag ASN1 submission git push dash dash tags. OK, I'm glad this happened. If this happened, don't worry. Everything is fine. As long as it says, as long as you don't have your ASN1 submission tag in red, you're OK. All this is saying is that basically when you push your ASN1 submission tag, my submission system makes a copy of the code that you have submitted, puts it on another branch, and it tags it with ASN1. Um, all, this, all this is saying is that you are trying to push ASN1, and that tag already exists. Don't worry about it. You're fine. As long as this one isn't in red for ASN1 submission, you're fine. And you will notice I got an email from the system. It tells me I've, I've submitted successfully, OK? 
Okay, so we've seen a ton in this topic. We talked about version control systems, why they're useful. We saw Git's concepts of its staging area, its local repos. We saw how to clone with Git clone. Um, checking the state of our working directory with Git status. Um, staging changes with Git add, move, and remove. Committing our changes with Git commit. We looked at Git log to see the, um, the commit graph. Git diff to see the actual changes between our commits. We can tag certain commits as being important with git tag. We can travel back in time with git checkout, revert changes with git revert. We can look at our remotes with git remote, and of course, pushing and pulling changes with git pull and push. Um, yeah, and then we looked at best practices and of course our workflow for CS2211. So, as I will do hopefully with most topics, I made you a nice little cheat sheet there so you can feel free to use that as you are working with Git.